Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk, featuring many of London, many of London, unsolved, 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 unsolved forgotten murders, all set within, all set within, all set within. Imagine if everything stopped. Without reason or warning, everything you ever knew or depended on suddenly ceased in the blink of an eye. When the COVID pandemic hit, for billions of people, the whole world stopped dead. Simple things we all took for granted became a massive concern, like our jobs, our health, our wealth and our loved ones. All of which was followed by mass panics over some of life's basics, like water, pasta, rice and toilet paper. These were desperate times, a crisis for our age, which pushed our stress levels to breaking point, our sanity to its limits, our tolerance to the edge, and many of us lost loved ones. But as the bulk of the population sat on their fat asses, staring at screens and grumbling about the loss of seemingly insignificant little luxuries, like trips to the flicks, nights in the pub, holidays in Greece, footy matches, concerts, picnics, and what they would do once they had completed Netflix. While some lamented their so-called hardships and woes, living a mildly inconvenienced life in lockdown, Others were really struggling. For those with physical disabilities and mental health issues, as well as those who selflessly provide the care that they so desperately need, even little changes to their routines can have a devastating effect. But what if, one day, without any warning, everything collapsed? Their routine upended, and they were forced to stay indoors every day with no end in sight. With every vital piece of specialist care and support services they had always relied on, taken away in the blink of an eye. And no matter how loud they shouted or how hard they cried, no one could hear them scream. Olga Freeman was a single mother living alone with her severely disabled son, Dylan. Every day was a struggle and every hour was difficult. But she coped as best she could, thanks to her dedication as a loving mother and the routines and services she had put in place to give Dylan the best life possible. But when the pandemic struck and everything stopped, Olga Freeman was left alone. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 145, A Desperate Lockdown for Olga Freeman. A little over one year ago, this was Olga's home that she shared with her 10-year-old son, Dylan. It is a small, two-bedroomed flat on the ground floor of 18 Cumberland Park in Acton, West London. The brickwork is white, the windows are large, there's a central door to the flats above and a small shared garden out back. Being a quiet little street, discreetly dotted with cars, trees and the occasional home converted into a community-minded business, like a dentist, a doctor's surgery or a nursery. It's not unlike any other street. If you were expecting a glib comment or an amusing quip by myself, as often happens in this part of the podcast, as a bit of levity before the heartbreaking horrors of this story unfolds, 
then think again. Olga was born, Olga Koronina, on the 19th of March 1980, in Moscow, Russia. Raised during the death throes of this communist state, with the Soviet Union dissolved on the 26th of December 1991, Russia developed closer links to the West, and Olga's financially successful family fulfilled their middle class aspirations. With political isolation a thing of the past, fortune was on their side as they headed into a bright future. With blonde hair, hazel eyes and a warm smile, Olga was blessed with an inviting face which matched her intoxicating personality. And combined with a methodical brain and a hard-working ethic, it was clear to everyone she met that she would be a success. By the turn of the millennium, she was studying law at Moscow State Law Academy. By the mid-2000s, she was doing her postgrad at BPP Law School in London. And being fluent in English, she later worked for several corporate law firms in the city. Life was blessed. She worked hard and the rewards paid off. Like anyone else, she enjoyed the fruits of her labor, but she didn't go to excesses. She didn't commit criminal acts. She didn't set out to hurt anyone, and she didn't have a bad bone in her body. By the end of the 2000s, Olga met and fell in love with Dean Freeman, the son of famed celebrity photographer Robert Freeman and a talented photographer in his own right, having shot portraits of the Spice Girls and David Beckham. Together, Olga and Dean traveled the world and lived the jet-set lifestyle that everybody would dream of. First-class tickets, exclusive parties, and to escape the stresses of life, they holidayed on a Brazilian tropical hideaway amidst the rainforest overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. The perfect life had fallen into place for Olga with good careers, the couple married. They moved into a £1 million Edwardian house in Acton. And on the 3rd of January 2010, their son, Dylan Valentine, was born. They had it all, and they lived a good life. But even for those who don't deserve it, fate can be cruel. Dylan was a sweet child, a dot of pink flesh with a mop of blonde hair, just like his mum. Like any parent, this bundle of joy was a delight, as in their eyes, he was beautiful and perfect in every way. But at a few days old, it was clear that Dylan wasn't well as he couldn't feed properly and his lungs were weak. Unlike the other babies, he didn't cry. Instead, the best he could muster was a weak high-pitched wail, like he was eternally dying. Physically, his body was frail and malformed. With his head abnormally small, a degenerative eye condition, and a set of narrow hands and feet crudely held together by weak muscles and loose joints, which made simple tasks like standing, walking, or holding objects difficult. Dylan was diagnosed with Cohen's syndrome, one of the rarest congenital birth defects with only 500 known cases across the world, for which there is no cure. Requiring constant care and love, he would be unable to walk, feed or function without help. With his brain as underdeveloped as his body, Dylan was also on the autistic spectrum, which meant he was prone to mood swings, struggled to communicate, and when he was sad or in pain, he couldn't express it, 
so instead he would howl like a wounded wolf cub. And as if that wasn't enough, he was also at a higher risk of infection and autoimmune disorders. Disability aside, Dylan blossomed into a lovely little boy who everyone described as gentle, happy and sweet and whose favourite part of the day was cuddling up with his mum as they watched Peppa Pig. Olga gave up everything for her beloved little son, her career, her lifestyle and her dreams. As a smart, driven businesswoman, she became his full-time carer, as he was her everything and she was his. To stimulate her son's body and brain, she took him swimming, to the park, to art galleries, and together this family of three went on overseas holidays. To aid his education, he went to a special needs school five days a week. And when she needed it, she got in respite care, as she knew that she had to be physically and mentally fit in order to cope. It wasn't easy, but Olga was incredibly patient. Although he struggled to swallow food, she would turn mealtimes into playtime just to get him to eat. As he howled by night, she sang him to sleep, and drained of all energy, she slept whenever she could. Olga was holding it together, but owing to the stresses of work and caring for Dylan, Olga and Dean separated and later divorced. To keep some consistency, Dylan spent the summers with his dad in Barcelona, where he now lived. But with the family home broken up as part of the divorce settlement, Olga and Dylan moved into a small, two-bedroomed ground floor flat at 18 Cumberland Park in Acton, not far from his school. As a recently single mum with a severely disabled son, life was hard, but she coped. But when the whole world was plunged into chaos, everything that Olga and Danny relied on collapsed. Throughout the winter of 2019 and 2020, COVID-19 wasn't a major issue. Brexit was on our mind, Trump was still president, and our Prime Minister Boris Johnson had dismissed it as a Chinese problem. With the virus over there, rather than over here, the whole world had sidestepped several outbreaks over the last few decades, such as swine flu, bird flu, SARS-1, Ebola, and Spanish flu was now a long and distant memory. On the 16th of March 2020, like so many countries across the planet, Britain entered a national lockdown. Good evening. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades. And this country is not alone. All over the world, we're seeing the devastating impact of this invisible killer. And so, tonight... Unessential shops were shut, unnecessary travel was banned, and public gatherings were forbidden. Everything was pared down to only the most basic of essentials. And as key workers carried on, doing a heroic job with no overtime nor protection. The selfish shoved the vulnerable aside, ransacked the shelves, and the sale of fridge freezers surged as the irresponsible hoarded chips, pizza and Kievs by the kilo. It was a crisis which showed everyone in their true colour, dividing the selfish from the selfless. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must... Stay at home. Because the critical thing you must do... Three days later, Olga celebrated her 40th birthday alone. Although in good spirits, she was rightfully concerned about the virus, as her son was at higher risk of infection than most. But with very little credible information being released on how to protect them both, 
All she could do was to be vigilant. For many, it was a time of great uncertainty. As rules were flouted, masks were non-existent, and the unscrupulous sold hand sanitizer at grossly inflated prices. Initially, the lockdown was only supposed to last for three weeks. But as the infection rate skyrocketed, emergency measures were introduced. On the 25th of March 2020, the British government fast-tracked through Parliament the Coronavirus Act to give them powers to slow the spread of the virus and to reduce the burden on public resources. Overnight, every school closed and many parents who were unqualified became their child's teacher. But this act also relaxed the legal onus on local councils to provide care for those with special needs. So alongside every school being shut, vital care and support services were withdrawn overnight. Gone was the specialist care. Gone were the respite carers. One week earlier, Dylan was attending a special school five days a week. An important time which aided his development and well-being, as well as giving Olga a very brief window to sleep and to mentally reboot. But now, it was just the two of them. Olga and Dylan were alone, stuck inside a small two-bedroom flat, day and night. With her family in Russia, her ex-husband in Spain, travel banned, and her friends isolating as everyone was, and shielding to protect her son from infection, this twosome stayed at home. Even little changes to his routine were traumatic. But now, everything familiar was gone. And as Dylan became more unsettled and agitated, the less he slept, the less she slept, as a numbness filled her mind and her body. As carefully as she could, she took Dylan for walks in the park. They played on a little trampoline in the back garden. They cuddled on the sofa, watching endless episodes of Peppa Pig. And she even bought him special pillows to help him sleep. Every day was exhausting. Every night was identical. And with the lockdown extended from weeks to months, there was no end in sight. Or so it seemed. We're taking the first careful steps to modify our measures. If there are outbreaks, if there are problems, we will not hesitate to put on the brakes. We've been through the initial... On the 10th of May 2020, after just nine weeks of limited isolation, with PPE still unavailable for every healthcare worker, and the UK listed as the worst infected country in Europe and the second worst in the world, the lockdown restrictions were lifted. Masks were binned, holidays were booked, and pubs reopened. We were three months from a second wave and six months from a vaccine. But with Fuck it. being the national response and everyone complaining, I'm bored now, I deserve some fun. With the government caring more about money than its people, the truly selfish acted as if a global pandemic had never happened. Lockdown had devastated Dylan's mental health it had left him agitated and volatile. But combined with the isolation and the exhaustion, even worse was how it had impacted on Olga. To help her sleep, she had started taking melatonin, a natural sleep aid to sedate her and Dylan. Being at her wit's end, she was prescribed antidepressants, as well as painkillers, 
as having to constantly carry her 10-year-old boy from the sofa to bed to the bath. The physical stresses of being his carer had damaged her knees. She hadn't slept in weeks. Her smile was gone, her eyes were dark, and her skin was sallow. Olga was now little more than a hollow ghost of her former self. But still, being the devoted and loving mother of a little boy who she would love with her last dying breath, she cared for Dylan as best she could. Throughout lockdown, she kept in regular contact with Ealing Council, who provided her son's care. And although some services had started to return, with a severe backlog and a staff shortage, they were slow to respond. On the 26th of June 2020, she asked the council for an increase in the carer's allowance, but this was rejected. On the 6th of July, as the carer was part funded by herself and Olga was unable to work, she requested an increase in funding to help cover the cost, but no decision was made. And on the 7th of July, she called the council, stating that she was under significant pressure, that she was feeling forgotten, and that, more importantly, she was so stressed she was not functioning mentally. Those words should have raised alarm bells, but they didn't. Diagnosed with depression and anxiety, Olga suffered a breakdown owing to the extreme stresses she was under. She was overwhelmed and she was broken, but her care for Dylan didn't stop for a single second and never once was he hurt, abused, or malnourished, as she never stopped loving her little boy. In the week leading up to the 15th of August 2020, Olga's depression had developed into a psychosis. Unable to eat, chain-smoking and guzzling coffee just to keep herself awake, she was sleep-deprived and isolated. And as her reality blurred, her mind was distorted by the sound of Dylan, howling like a wounded wolf. At times, Olga said that she was experiencing supernatural events. She heard voices, she saw apparitions, and gripped with delusions of grandeur, she even believed that she was the second coming of Jesus. Adita Serpikaya, her friend and former nanny, was worried. Having heard Olga's ramblings about her mission, how they were waiting for her in Jerusalem, and how this was the best thing for Dylan, worried that she would flee the country, having purchased two tickets to Tel Aviv, Adita hid her passport. But by then, it would be too late. On Saturday the 15th of August 2020, at about 10 p.m., Olga texted Adita with the words, I am done. Calling her back, Adita was so concerned that she recorded their conversation. As Olga admitted, I have sacrificed my beloved child to create a balance in the world. It was impossible to believe, but sadly, it was true. Adita arrived at 12.45 a.m. She wasn't allowed into the bedroom, but Olga confessed to what she had done. She reported to Acton Police Station stating, I have killed my son. And at 2.15 a.m., with Dylan found unresponsive, the little boy was pronounced dead 
and Olga was arrested for his murder. Seeing this as her only option, Olga was as gentle with his death as she had been with his life. Having fed him a sedative in a spoonful of mashed up banana, as he slowly drifted off, she tucked him up under her duvet to keep him safe and warm. As for the very last time, she kissed her little boy goodnight. As Cohen's disease had ravaged his lungs, to aid his departure, she placed a bath sponge in his mouth and secured it with the strap of her bra and a strip of sellotape. He didn't panic. He felt no pain, and his death was quick. As he faded away into a long eternal sleep, surrounded by the toys he loved so much. His teddies, his Thomas the Tank Engine, and his Peppa Pig. A post-mortem was conducted at Great Ormond Street Hospital, where a pathologist confirmed the death was caused by upper airway obstruction. There were no signs of abuse, bruises or neglect. On the 25th of January 2021, the trial was held at the Old Bailey, with Olga seen via video link from the Orchard Ward a psychiatric unit at St. Bernard's Hospital in West London, where she pleaded guilty to manslaughter. It was undeniable to everyone that this was a truly tragic case of a single mother doing her very best under extraordinary circumstances, and at which both Dylan and Olga were the victims. In her summation, the judge stated to Olga, that you loved your son and sacrificed yourself for him, I have no doubt. The burden of caring for a severely disabled boy was one you took on, as mothers do, out of love and duty. I can see that, and I can see how you discharged it faithfully for years. You fought for your son to have the best support, but it was a burden that took an enormous toll on you. Although he was not able to tell you so, I am sure you were loved by him and there will have been many joys in the life you led together. I have no doubt, at all, that you were a loving and dedicated mother to a vulnerable child until multiple pressures overwhelmed you and your mind. On the 11th of February 2021, Olga Freeman was sentenced to an indefinite hospital order. And as of today, she remains at the Orchard Unit. A report into the council's lack of care during the pandemic stated, it is clear from the evidence of this review that this death could not have been foreseen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. As always, if you enjoy a bit of non-compulsory chit-chat about cake, tea, and other details about this case, as well as a little quiz, then feel free to join me after the break. A big thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who are James Parry, Verity Harrington, Emily Clark, and Margaret Christensen. I thank you for supporting the show as well as my ever-expanding waistline. With a special thank you to James for your kind donation via the supporter link. I thank you. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening and sleep well.
Well, there we go, everyone. It was a, ni a nice, happy episode for everyone to enjoy. Uh, so let's do, let's do extra mile. Uh, I'm going to try and pick up the kind of... Uh, that's a bit of a difficult one to get through. Are you probably difficult for you to listen to? Difficult for me to say the words on. I struggled through that. How long was that episode? Yeah, it took, it took a long while to get through that one. Oh, dear God. That was one of those episodes that it, it was happening during lockdown and I kept an eye on it and I thought, you know, I, I thought to myself, um, maybe there won't be enough to kind of cover the episode. But actually... Actually, when I started diving into it, I thought to myself, do you know what, this makes for an inter interesting episode in its own right. Do you know, we've just come out of lockdown. Everyone's kind of got like, oh, we're going on holiday. It's over. There's no pandemic. Oh, everything's fine. Oh, God, my life was so stressful because I'd because I would watched everything on Netflix. And oh, the stress of not being able to go to a pub, you know, it it kind of still annoys me that people are quite petty about how it's affected them and it has affected everyone it's affected everyone in different ways but you know it's just there's a lot of people out there who are who have had a worse life than us through lockdown do you know as they say do you know the the incidents of kind of uh domestic abuse went up uh, we'll dive into some some stats on this in a bit and you think about it do you know if you're mentally healthy and you're physically well lockdown's not really a problem you know which you know it's a, it's you know, we we find ways of coping with it. But if you if you've got the mechanisms in place to help you cope with life and then life goes all crazy and it's out of your control, what are you meant to do? So that's really what I wanted to have. I wanted to have a I felt that was it was a good time to have a bit of an attack on, on people who, let's be honest, quite a few people have been quite selfish during lockdown. And really do you know, I, I remember going in the supermarket and seeing, you know, an old person trying to reach the shelves to get some uh, some toilet paper and it was all you know it all disappeared she couldn't see out back I, I, I had a look for and I was like I'm sorry there's nothing on there and when I went around the other aisles there was people there with trolleys and they'd stocked up on pasta and you know, all the toilet papers and shit like that and it's like oh I'm thinking about myself or I'm thinking about my family inverted commas but it's kind of you know the whole world is our family really we need to start thinking about other people and being thinking about people who are more vulnerable and more in need so uh, yeah yeah Oh, so um, I'm just gonna open some windows, open the open the door, get some fresh air in. It's not too hot today, which is all right. I don't think we've we haven't really had a uh, a, a a summer as such, which is good. I, I can't be bothered with summer. Uh, let's just go and pop me on a cup a cup of tea. Had me coffees for the day. Uh, done my water already. Water's already in the kettle. There we go. That saves time. Well done, Michael. Uh, tea bag in. It's a PG. Two sugars. Oh, this is exciting. Uh, and powdered milk. Right, coming back. Uh, well, oh, welcome to Extra Mile. I didn't do that, but did I? To people who are new to Extra Mile, this is kind of, you know, it's waffle. It's waffle. Fill you in on some details. We do some quiz questions. There's some extra details about the case that I kind of felt didn't feel right in the episode, so I, I leave them for here. Uh, you're welcome to stay, but you're welcome to go as well. Uh, what else is going on in the world? Um, uh, I'm now able to put all the old back episodes up on YouTube. Uh, so if you want to, um, I, I know like me, a lot of people you listen to their phone, but some people listen at work uh, or at their desk. And, you know, sometimes your boss might be like, oh, God, you can't be listening to stuff. But, you know, you can use YouTube and you can sneakily listen to Murder Mile while you're at work. So all the old episodes are there. So go to the YouTube channel. It's in the show notes. You've also got the old uh, location videos are there as well. So you can have a browse through them as well. So they're all there. What else is going on? Gearing up for winter. It's Today is the 1st of September. As of recording at 9... This is 9.55am. Uh powered through writing this i'm getting good at kind of gearing i'm gearing up for next year to give myself extra time so i'm, I'm learning to write an episode in two days instead of three or sometimes it used to be four I'm, I'm 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 saying to myself stop waffling michael stop daydreaming focus i'm doing that so that's good so hopefully i can get i can learn to get the edit down a little bit fast a little bit not faster but more efficiently i'm trying to be efficient that's the key word so that's all good. Uh, I'm uh, gearing up for winter. So we got a couple of months until winter now. So uh, I'm going out on my little walks with a little bag. And I'm picking up all the uh, the, the broken bits of logs and... Not logs, but I can't carry those. But like 
things that can turn into kindling so that you know the woods near me all the all the bits of wood are on the floor and they've gone through they've gone through winter and they've gone through a spring and a summer and now they go through it's gone hot and cold and they're all good for kindling so i've got those got coal on board i've just filled up with water uh waiting for the coal boat to come past and get a little bit more coal some more kindling uh maybe a gas bottle and then that's me ready for winter which would be good uh planning for the next year ahead which is all good so the end of murder mile tours that'll be good hopefully the new tour in the new year but i'll work on that at some point i'm just trying to gear myself up to for a, a kind of a little bit more fun in life and a little bit less stress and you know uh hopefully not working so like i normally work seven days a week i'm trying to I'm trying to get to the point where i can finally take a weekend off that would be lovely uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, oh, look, kettle's boiling. Let's grab it before it boils. Let's just put it in while it's almost boiled, which you're meant to do with tea, tea and coffee anyway. It's not going to go in. Uh, oh, it's not going to go in boiled because apparently you, you ruin the coffee, and uh, it's apparently the same with the tea bag as well. It's meant to be. It's meant to be just sub boiling. Oh, this is exciting, Michael. Thank you for that that veritable feast of information just letting the tea bag stew what else have we got got some uh, if you're a patron subscriber i've just done the last kind of blast of mugs online uh, i've still got some available so i put them on my so on my facebook uh, the motor mile discussion group i've popped them on there so people are buying mugs so that's all good um if i can uh, I just need to find space the problem is I have no space on the boat to kind of store stuff so I can't I can't have like 30 mugs is a lot of space on my boat I really don't have space for it so I can't have a backlog of, of stuff sitting here so uh if I can work out how to do that I might get some extra mugs on the boat and then start up I'll, I'll hope to upload them onto the website what else is going on I'm just about to post off three mugs to people very shortly which would be very exciting. Uh, so I've got to go to the post office, but the post office is right next to Simpsons Cake Shop. Oh yes, they do the they do like handmade cakes, really nice. Not the uh, there's a Morrison's around the corner, which is fine. They do some nice cakes, but this Simpsons around the corner. Oh yes, very nice. Uh, so I'm going to treat myself very shortly. I'm I'm still trying to be good. I'm still trying not. I'm still not pigging out and stuff. But I'm kind of you know, allowing myself to go back onto cakes and things. Right. Let's do the quiz questions, and then I'll go and grab my tea, and then we'll come back and do extra stuff. Right. Get ready. Don't forget. I'll probably balls up some of these questions. Uh, so here goes. Question one. What was Danny's middle name? Question two. What sleep aid did Olga take and use to sedate Danny? Question three. Which celebrities did Olga's husband take photos of? Obviously, he took photos of loads, but these were the main ones that I mentioned. Uh, question four. Which capital city did Olga come from? Question five. What did Olga originally do as a job? Question six. Uh, where was Danny's autopsy conducted? Question seven. What genetic disorder did Dylan suffer from? Hang on, Dylan. Danny. Oh, bollocks. Have I, have I said Danny in this episode? Why, why have I written Dylan there? Hang on. Oh, bollocks. Don't say I've got to go and start re-recording stuff. Oh, Michael. Dylan. Oh, bollocks. You know what? I'm going to have to redo some of this uh, episodes because I think in the later parts I've written Danny in some parts. And I don't know why I've written Danny. Oh, fuck. Right. Dylan. I've written Dylan there. Dylan, Dylan, Dylan. And then I know later on I've written Danny. This is annoying. That's fine. I will go back in and I will re-edit those. Pretend you didn't hear that. I'm glad I picked up on that. Well done, Michael. Uh, so which genetic disorder did uh, Dylan suffer from? See, ab above there in question six, I've written Danny's autopsy. It's not Danny, it's Dylan. Oh, Michael. <sighs> that means extra work. I can't believe I didn't spot that in the rewrite. Right. Uh, oh, well, there we go. Uh, question. Uh, so which genetic disorder did Dylan suffer from? Question eight, 
What hospital is Olga currently in? Uh, question nine. What country did they have a rainforest coastal retreat in? So that's uh, Dean and Olga. And question ten. Which capital city did Olga? Uh, which capital city did Olga's ex-husband Dean live in? Just gonna go grab my tea and then punch myself in the face for being a freaking idiot. How did I? Well, it happens. I, that's always the way. So you, you focus on all the little details, like making sure the dates are right and things like that, and then you realise maybe I was, I was probably thinking about someone else. Someone else. Oh well, there we go. Right, let's uh, let's plod on. Um, hang on. I need to make sure I don't balls up this question. So, uh, uh, Dylan's disability. Oh, Michael. How did you end up writing Danny? Fuck's sake. Uh, so, Dylan's disability. Obviously, I won't mention what the name of it is because that's going to be one of the quiz questions. Uh, it took a little while for them to work. They, within a couple of days, they knew that there was a problem with him. But it took a little while because while, the, the syndrome that he has is kind of it's difficult to diagnose at the start. It's kind of it's only as the because it's a de developmental disorder. So it's only as the as the child starts to develop that you can kind of see things going on. So. Um, they knew at the start he wasn't feeding properly. His lungs weren't particularly good. But as he was growing, his head kind of wouldn't grow at the same rate that it should do. Um, as mentioned, his, his hands and feet were kind of very narrow and thin, which meant it was difficult for him to grip things and to stand. He had suffered with muscle weakness. Uh, and he was on the autistic spectrum as well. Um, so... Uh, he was unable to communicate, so uh, which is why it's mentioned throughout that often at nights when he was upset or he was in pain, he would howl like a dog. This was all he was really able to do. He had difficulty sleeping all the time, um, which obviously made it really difficult for uh, Olga as well. I'm glad I got Olga's name right. That's a, that's a start. Uh, he also suffered with uh, a visual impairment to the eyes as well. So I, I'll post a picture of him. But when you see the picture of him, he's a, you know, a lovely little boy, uh, kind of mopper blonde hair, kind of Coke bottle bottom glasses. But uh, as everyone said, you know, he's quite insular, kind of uh, stays within himself uh, or within, with his mum. Uh, what else was there? Um, as mentioned, uh, he had a high risk of autoimmune disorders and infection, which is why um, they had to keep kind of keep an eye on him, protect him a lot. But especially when the pandemic happened, and especially given the fact that people didn't really know what coronavirus was and what it did, and that it grossly affected people's lungs at the time. Uh, this, this was kind of you. You can imagine how the kind of the terror was going on in in her mind at that point, thinking, you know, if this is a virus that affects lungs, and she's got a, a son with a lung disorder as well as multiple mental health and physical health dish, issues, you know, this is going to be really devastating for him. Um, uh, a week after lockdown, the Coronavirus Act was uh, enacted by the government. It was a kind of fast track through Parliament. Um, I know it's it's kind of easy to say that you know, the problem is we had it was I don't think a lot of people took it seriously at the start, which is why I've tried to be, be a little more balanced with it. You know, we've had a lot of kind of uh, as mentioned, we had Ebola, we have uh, had a uh, bird flu, we had swine flu, we've had SARS one. You know, we've had a lot of viruses in the news coming out. They can, tend to happen. You know, Ebola happened and it was devastating, but we were kind of like ah, well, you know, it's Africa you know uh bird flu oh well that's over in asia so that's not really a problem for us that's kind of, that's kind of the mentality and i think that w there was a lot of that at the start like oh it's another virus that's fine it's not really going to cause us a problem oh look it's over in china well that's their problem um unfortunately our government as many governments did didn't take it seriously at the start i don't we weren't the only ones who had governments who are fucking idiots unfortunately this is the problem i think this is the problem with a lot of governments in the world is that they don't you know, they, they don't hire the best. You would think that if you have uh, an organisation that's going to run your whole country, you would hire the best. You know, in some governments you do, like if you the Minister for Education, they hire an ex-teacher. The Minister for Health, you hire an ex-doctor or nurse. If you hire a Minister for Business, you hire someone who's ran a business. What do we do? We hire 
pricks, I'm sorry to say that, pricks who basically just want to be politicians. They don't know anything else and therefore they can go from being minister of sport to minister for media to minister health to minister for defence. It's like they can be battered around because they're, they're useless, they're pathetic. We should really hire people who know what they're talking about. Have experts, I know, that crazy word, experts. Unfortunately, we don't, therefore, uh, do you know, no one really took coronavirus as seriously as they should. Therefore, the act was rushed through, as always, emergency measures. And unfortunately, uh, it's it's all very well putting an umbrella term in there saying, do you know... Um, you know they need to restrict the virus and and uh, lessen the burden on public health services but the problem is that, that that's a big umbrella turn that covers a lot of things and yes that will help you know protect the nhs which was would eventually be swamped again because the government hadn't bothered to think in advance you know bojo the clown our unfortunate prime minister uh, had said oh no it's nothing it'll be sorted in three weeks if we all remember that uh, and he went around hospitals shaking hands with patients and doctors, even though he was told not to, and then he got coronavirus. Lovely. What a treat. Well done. Well done. That's exactly what a leader should do. So, unfortunately, um, the Coronavirus Act causes um, caused as many problems as it kind of helped resolve problems, as mentioned. Uh, parents who have children with mental health and, health and physical health needs were already looking at this. They're already going, this is absolutely devastating because what it did was, it, it exact words, it relaxed the legal onus on local authorities to provide care laid down in children's individual education, health and care plans and instead required them, in inverted commas, to do everything they can to continue to meet their existing duties. But that's so incredibly vague because it's like to, you know, try to do your best given the situation. But it's, you know, everything was everything had been shut down. Do you know, there was no PPA. People were not allowed to go and visit other people's houses. Do you know, you had to stay in your bubble. It's like if you're someone like Olga and your your son has a routine, and <coughs> you need to keep him safe and protected in the house. It's a nightmare. What do you know, everything had shut down. What is she going to do? Do you know, absolutely crazy situation uh so uh as mentioned you know she got a little bit of a history of depression but nothing major on that point uh as she went through lockdown this was about nine weeks nine to ten weeks was the first initial lockdown and then we went in, down into a lifting of lockdown restrictions which if you can imagine that as well i know everyone was going yeah lockdown's over yeah i'm gonna go on holiday i'm gonna get pissed in pubs and you know it, it was all chaotic which is why we went into a second wave um think of it from olga's point of view do you know she's got her during lockdown okay do you know uh, it was difficult for her but again people do you know we were trying to keep the infection rate down but when people went hey fuck it we're gonna have a great time imagine those scenes you're watching that on the telly and thinking how many of those people have the virus how is it spreading and it did it skyrocketed it went absolutely freaking crazy just because people were like oh fuck it i need to have some fun yeah, we do need to have some fun. Yeah, but you've just got, you know, you can have fun and you can be sensible at the same time. You know, I'm I'm still doing this sensibly. Why? I, do you know what? Uh, I, I'm trying to protect my family and other people's family. That's why I do it. Uh, so she was put on antidepressants at the time. Obviously, you know, this uh, there's a real backlog with doctors around that point. I remember around that time that you couldn't actually physically go to see a doctor anymore. You had to call up and the doctor would call you. And it's, you know, for a doctor, big part of what they do is physically seeing you and kind of, you know, looking at you. That That's really what they do. But trying to analyse people over the phone... What was the doctor able to do? All he could really do was put her on antidepressants. Mental health services were already exhausted. So, you know, uh, absolute nightmare. Um, I didn't put this in the episode. I did consider it. But the number of domestic homicides rose in London during 2020. So during the lockdown, uh, with a steep increase in the number of children killed amid concerns that coronavirus restrictions uh, may have had an impact. Figures released by the Metropolitan Police show that although the overall number of killings in the capital fell from 126, uh, fell to 126 from 150 in 2019, the number of domestic murders rose uh, from 16 to 22, and 12 of those victims killed uh, in a domestic setting were children, which was almost double above the previous year. Uh, 
I mean, it, uh, understandable. Do you know people kind of stuck at home, not able to go out, a lot of frustrations, things like that. People getting upset, you know, taking it out on each other. Uh, entirely wrong, but unfortunately, some pe- some people are w- aren't wired correctly. Do you know, some people lash out, some people get angry, some people feel the need to punch someone. Whereas, do you know, the, the people who are wired correctly know, do you know. If I'm upset, I go for a walk. That's what I do. I, I I do a lot of walking. It gets a lot of frustrations out. And by the time I come back, I'm a little bit, little bit tired. But you know what? I've had it's given me a time to think through all the problems, which is a, something that I do. I enjoy it. Uh, as mentioned, 26th of June, 2020, Olga emailed the council saying that she was stressed. She was having a lot of difficulties. Not only uh, were her knees playing her up, but she'd started to she'd started to get arthritis by that point as well. Um, she'd formerly had a carer in for about 30 hours a week. Um, there was carer funding starting to come back in by that point, which was uh, carer was coming in about 16 hours a week. Um, but the problem is, she said, because there was a lack of uh, staff shortage, it was entirely inconsistent. And you can't have inconsistency with uh, anyone who's kind of got uh, the problems that Dylan has. Hooray, I got his name wrong, right, for once. Oh, I've got to redo all that. That's fine. I've done, do you know what? I had an episode once before. I can't remember which one, ages ago, where I got someone's name wrong entirely for the whole episode. I had to go in and redo. Not not the whole lot, but I, I was, I'm able to sneak bits in. Uh, what else is there? Uh, let's see. Oop. Boat going past. Going past too fast. And, oh, my boat is scraping along the... Uh, the bottom of the canal because it's very shallow uh, around the edges it looks like it's really deep but it's not it's incredibly shallow uh, oh it's a horrible sound luckily it's steel so all it does is make a great noise but it's not not hot it doesn't cause any damage uh, uh what else we got uh oh around the time so uh, uh adita who was uh olga's friend and former nanny uh when the kind of lockdown kind of broke out she was able even though you can appreciate it she's already got her own job and you know she's probably got her own family and she's got her own concerns uh she uh came in herself and started working about 12 hours a week to kind of help Olga, Olga get through this uh but by that point she'd noticed a severe decline in uh Olga's mental health um Adita was the same person who kind of, you know, uh, Olga called the night before um, and uh, came round and, and took her to the police station. Uh, as mentioned, the trial was held at the Old Bailey. Uh, there was initially a a uh, the coroner's trial was held at uh, I think it was Uxbridge Magistrates Court, um, but the trial was at the Old Bailey. Uh, this was relatively uh, a simple one. Everyone kind of. Everyone was in agreement at that point that it was a, it was a truly tragic case uh, because of COVID restrictions and the fact uh, that Olga was in a mental health unit at that point. This was all done, being done by video conference. Uh, when was it? Yeah, actually, by that point, we'd already gone back into the second or third lockdown. I can't remember which one was which. Because unfortunately we had we had the tier four bullshit and that's that's confused me a lot about what, what was a lockdown what wasn't a lockdown it was all very confusing. Anyway, she attended court. She it was from video link. She appeared very pale. Uh, her hair was kind of loose around her face, and she was wearing a a, a, a cardigan with a red and white shirt. Uh, when you look at the the difference in the pictures between her when she was kind of uh, married and having a wonderful life and then uh the the fo- the mugshot photo taken after you know the months of lockdown you can see a real difference in her face it looks you know, she looks absolutely drained and exhausted uh what else was there i will let's do the judge's summation uh i used a bit of this at the end but let's let's try a bit of it now so it was mrs justice shima grubb uh, she told Og- Olga, the expert psychiatrists who uh, who have met and assessed you, including the one treating you at the mm-mm unit at the mm-mm hospital in West London, uh, where you are presently held, all agree this is one of those rare and desperately, <laughs> desperately sad cases where a devoted parent commits a shocking act of violence towards a precious, innocent, beloved child uh, while completely out of their right mind. 
that you loved your son and sacrificed yourself for him, I have no doubt. The burden of caring for a severely disabled boy was one you took on, as mothers do, out of love and and duty. Uh, those imperceptible ties. I can see and I can um I can see that and I can see how you discharged it faithfully for years. You fought for your son to have the best support and your own life was bounded by this. Um but it was a burden that took an enormous toll on you. Although he was not able to tell you so, I am sure you were loved by him uh and there will be have been many joys in the life that you led together as the family photographs I have seen have shown. Uh I have I have no doubt at all that you were a remarkably loving and dedicated mother to a vulnerable child under multiple pressures uh, until multiple pressures overwhelmed you and your mind were swamped by a destructive depressive illness with florid psychotic elements. So um uh, it was it was a relatively simple case for everyone you know there's no denying that she'd done what she'd done she admitted to it everyone knew it was a a, a tragic case uh and she so she's under a uh, a whole life uh hospital order at the moment which means um she will be held in a hospital in a psychiatric unit until until the doctors say that she is she is mentally well to be released so there will be no period of time she won't go to prison for the crime that she done everyone is under agreement this is this is a mental health problem um and that's where she will stay until until they they say that she is that she is well to be released into the community if she's not well to release be released into the community then uh that is where she will stay oh that was um happy days lovely story oh right now i need to go back in and re-edit in uh dylan instead of danny i hope i haven't done too many such an idiot it happens doesn't it It happens good cared for dylan i think i think i've only done one or two dylan 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 i think i've only done a one or two oh michael anyway that's that done hope you all enjoyed that uh as much as you can enjoy an episode like that uh next week again an, another entirely diff- different one so well uh but hopefully this one won't be as uh, depressing this was a, a very depressing episode and rightly so uh so thank you uh everyone for listening thank you for supporting the podcast it's all very much appreciated hope you're all having a good life and you're doing well and you know even though the world may be still in a bit of a horrific place let's not forget you know your life is even though it may seem difficult at times it's not as bad as some people so do you know what sometimes that can be a blessing uh have yourself a good week stay safe be good lots of love bye bye oh shit <laughs> well while i was busy thinking about um uh re-putting danny or dylan back in and could have balls everything up i'd entirely forgot to do, do the answers to the quiz questions so here we go God damn, I'm all over the shop today. Question number one. What was Danny's... Oh, see, it balls it up there. What was Dylan's middle name? I'll give everyone this answer for free because I balls up the question. Uh, what was Dylan's middle name? It was Valentine. Um, question number two. What sleep aid did Olga, did Olga take and use to sedate Dylan? It was melatonin. Question three, which celebrities did Olga's husband or ex-husband take pictures of? It was the Spice Girls and David Beckham. Of course, he did many others. Question four, which capital city did Olga come from? That was Moscow. Question five, what did Olga originally do as a job? She was a corporate lawyer. Question six, where did Dylan's autops where was Dylan's autopsy conducted? Great Ormond Street Hospital. Question seven. What genetic disorder did Dylan suffer from? See, I've got it right in that question. Uh Cohen's syndrome. Question eight. What hospital is Olga currently in? This it's the Orchard Ward of the St. Bernard's Hospital in Ealing. Uh, and right at the back of there. At the back of that hospital is the canal, and that's where the body of Alice Gross was found. Uh, question nine: What country 
did uh, the couple have a rainforest co coastal retreat in? That was Brazil. And 10, which capital city did Olga's ex-husband Dean live in? That was Barcelona. There we go. I only fucked up so much. Right, now I've got to go and edit all this. Oh, dear God. Have yourself a good week. Stay safe. Be good. Lots of love. Bye-bye.